The following is a portion of the book, The Barren Fig Tree, or the doom and downfall of the fruitless professor, showing that the day of grace may be passed with him long before his life is ended. The signs also by which such miserable mortals may be known by John Bunyan, who being dead yet speaketh, Hebrews 11 verse 4, printed originally in 1688. This solemn searching awful treatise was published by Bunyan in 1682, but does not appear to have been reprinted until a very few months after his decease, which so unexpectedly took place in 1688. The Signs of Being Past Grace Now then, to show you by some signs how you may know that the day of grace is ended, or near to ending, with the barren professor, and after that thou shalt cut it down. He has stood it out against God, and that has withstood all those means for fruit that God has used for making of him. If it might have been a fruitful tree in his garden, he is in this danger, and this indeed is the sum of the parable. The fig tree here mentioned was blessed with the application of means, had time allowed it to receive the nourishment, but it outstood, withstood, and overstood all, all that the husbandman did, all that the vine dresser did. But a little distinctly to particularize in four or five particulars. First sign, the day of grace is like to be passed when a professor has withstood, abused, and worn out God's patience. Then he is in danger. This is a provocation. Then God cries, cut it down. There are some men that steal into a profession nobody knows how, even as this fig tree was brought into the vineyard by other hands than God's. And there they abide lifeless, graceless, careless, and without any good conscience to God at all. Perhaps they come in for the loaves, for a trade, for credit for a blind, or it may be to stifle and choke the checks and grinding pangs of an awakened and disquieted conscience. Now having obtained their purpose, like the sinners of Zion, they are at ease and secure, saying like Agag, surely the bitterness of death is past. First Samuel 15 verse 22 I am well, shall be saved, and go to heaven. Thus in these vain conceits they spend a year two, or three, not remembering that at every season of grace and at every opportunity of the gospel the Lord comes seeking fruit. Well, sinner, well, barren fig tree, this is but a coarse beginning. God comes for fruit. What have I here, saith God? What a fig tree is this, that has stood this year in my vineyard and brought me forth no fruit? I will cry unto him, Professor, barren fig tree, be fruitful. I look for fruit. I expect fruit. I must have fruit. Therefore bethink thyself. At these the professor pauses, but these are words, not blows. Therefore off goes this consideration from the heart. When God comes the next year, he finds him still as he was, a barren, fruitless cumberer of the ground. And now again he complains. Here are two years gone, and no fruit appears. Well, I will defer mine anger. For my name's sake will I defer mine anger, and for my praise will I refrain for thee, that I cut thee not off. As yet, Isaiah 48, verse 9. I will wait, I will wait to be gracious. But this helps not. This is not the least influence upon the barren fig tree. Tush, says he, here is no threatening. God is merciful. He will defer his anger. He waits to be gracious. I am not yet afraid. Isaiah 30, verse 18. Oh, how ungodly men that are unawares crept into the vineyard. How do they turn the grace of our God into lasciviousness? Well, he comes the third year for fruit as he did before. But still he finds but a barren fig tree. No fruit. Now he cries out again. O oh, thou dresser of my vineyard, come hither. Here is a fig tree that has stood these three years in my vineyard, and has at every season disappointed my expectation, for I have looked for fruit in vain. Cut it down. My patience is worn out. I shall wait on this fig tree no longer. 
and now he begins to shake the fig tree with his threatenings. Fetch out the axe. Now the axe is death. Death, therefore, is called for. Death, come smite me this fig tree. And withal the Lord shakes the sinner and whirls him upon a sick bed, saying, Take him, death. He has abused my patience and forbearance, not remembering that it should have led him to repentance and to the fruits thereof. Death, fetch away this fig tree to the fire. Fetch this barren professor to hell. As this death comes with grim looks into the chamber, yea, and hell follows with him to the bedside, and both stare this professor in the face, yea, begin to lay hands upon him, one smiting him with pains in his body, with headache, heartache, backache, shortness of breath, fainting, qualms, trembling of joints, stopping at the chest, and almost all the symptoms of a man past all recovery. Now while death is thus tormenting the body, hell is doing with the mind and conscience, striking them with its pains, casting sparks of fire in there, wounding with sorrows and fears of everlasting damnation, the spirit of this poor creature. And now he begins to bethink himself and to cry to God for mercy, Lord, spare me, Lord, spare me. Nay, saith God, you have been a provocation to me these three years. How many times have you disappointed me? How many seasons have you spent in vain? How many sermons and other mercies did I of my patience afford you, but to no purpose at all? Take him, death. O oh, good Lord, saith the sinner, spare me but this once, raise me but this once. Indeed, I have been a barren professor, and have stood to no purpose at all in thy vineyard. But spare, oh, spare this one time, I beseech thee, and I will be better. Away, away, you will not. I have tried you these three years already. You are nothing. If I should recover you again, you would be as bad as you were before. And all this talk is while death stands by. The sinner cries again, Good Lord, try me, I will be better. Well, saith God, death, let this professor alone for this time. I will try him a while longer. He has promised he hath vowed, and he will amend his ways. It may be he will mind to keep his promises. Vows are solemn things. It may be he may fear to break his vows. Arise from off the bed, and now God lays down his axe. It this the poor creature is very thankful, praises God and fawns upon him, shows as if he did it heartily, and calls to others to thank him too. He therefore rises, as one would think, to be a new creature indeed. But by that he has put on his clothes, he has come down from his bed, and ventured into the yard or shop, and there sees how all things are gone to sixes and sevens. He begins to have second thoughts, and says to his folks, What have you all been doing? How are all things out of order? I am, I cannot tell. What behind hand? One may see if a man be but a little to a side, that you have neither wisdom nor prudence to order things. And now instead of seeking to spend the rest of his time to God, he doubles his diligence after this world. Alas, all must not be lost. We must have provident care. And thus, quite forgetting the sorrows of death, the pains of hell, the promises and vows which he made to God to be better, because judgment was not now speedily executed, therefore the heart of this poor creature is fully set in him to do evil. These things proven ineffectual, God takes hold of his axe again, sends death to a wife, to a child, to his cattle. Your young men have I slain and taken away your horses. Amos 4, 9 and 10. I will blast him, cross him, disappoint him and cast him down and will set myself against him and all that he puts his hand unto. At this a poor barren professor cries out again, Lord, I have sinned. Spare me once more, I beseech thee. Or take not away the desire of mine eyes. Spare my children. Bless me in my labors and I will mend and be better. No, saith God, you lied to me last time. I will trust you in this no longer. And withal he tumbleth the wife, the child, the estate, 
into a grave, and then returns to his place till his professor more unfeignedly acknowledges his offense. Hosea 5, verses 14 and 15. At this the poor creature is afflicted and distressed, rends his clothes, and begins to call the breaking of his promise and vows to mind. He mourns and prays, and like Ahab, a while walks softly at the remembrance of the justness of the hand of God upon him, and now he renews his promises. Lord, try me this one time more. Take off thy hand and see. They go far that never turn. Well, God spares him again sets down his axe again. Many times he did deliver them, but they provoked him with their counsel and were brought low for their iniquity. Psalm 106, verse 43. Now they seem to be thankful again, and are as if they were resolved to be godly indeed. Now they read, they pray, they go to meetings and seem to be serious a pretty while, but at last they forget. Their lusts prick them. Suitable temptations present themselves. Wherefore they turn to their own crooked ways again. When he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. Nevertheless they did flatter him with their mouth, and they lied unto him with their tongue. Psalm 78, verses 34 to 36. Yet again the Lord will not leave this professor, but will take up his axe again, and will put him under a more heart-searching ministry, a ministry that shall search him and turn him over and over, a ministry that shall meet with him as Elijah met with Ahab and all his acts of wickedness, and now the axe is laid to the roots of the trees. Besides this ministry doth not only search the heart, but presents the sinner with the golden rays of the glorious gospel. Now is Christ Jesus set forth evidently. Now is grace displayed sweetly. Now, now are the promises broken like boxes of ointment to the perfuming of the whole room. But alas, there is yet no fruit on this fig tree. While his heart is searching, he wrangles. While the glorious grace of the gospel is unveiling, this professor wags and is wanton, gathers up some scraps thereof, tastes the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon him. Th Hebrews 6, 3-8, Jude verse 4, But brings not forth fruit meat for him whose gospel it is, takes no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. 2 Kings 10, verse 31, But counts that the glory of the gospel consists in talk and show, and that our obedience thereto is a matter of speculation, that good works lie in good words, and if they can finally talk, they think they bravely please God. They think the kingdom of God consists only in word, not in power, and thus proves ineffectual this force means also. Well, now the axe begins to be heaved higher, for now indeed God is ready to smite the sinner. Yet before he will strike the stroke, he will try one way more at the last, and if that misses, down goes the fig tree. Now this last way is to tug and strive with this professor by his spirit. Wherefore the spirit of the Lord is now come to him, but not always to strive with man. Genesis 6, verse 3. Yet a while he will strive with him. He will awaken. He will convince. He will call to remembrance former sins, former judgments, the breach of former vows and promises, the misspending of former days. He will also present persuasive arguments, encouraging promises, dreadful judgments, the shortness of time to repent in, and that there is hope if he come. Further, he will show him the certainty of death, and of the judgments to come. Yea, he will pull and strive with the sinner, but behold, the mischief now lies here. Here is tugging and striving on both sides. The Spirit convinces. The man turns a deaf ear to God. The Spirit saith, Receive my instruction and live. But the man pulls away his shoulder. The Spirit shows him where he is going, but the man closes his eyes against it. The Spirit offers violence. The man strives and resists. They have done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Hebrews 10.29 The Spirit parlieth a second time and urges reasons of a new nature, but the sinner answers, No, I have loved strangers, and after them I will go. Amos 4.6-12 At this 
God's fury comes up into his face. Now he comes out of his holy place and is terrible. Now he sweareth in his wrath. They shall never enter into his rest. Hebrew 3 verse 11. I exercise towards you my patience. Yet you have not turned unto me, saith the Lord. I smote you in your person, in your relations, in your estate. Yet you have not returned unto me, saith the Lord. And your filthiness is lewdness, because I have purged thee, and you were not purged. You shall not be purged from your filthiness any more till I cause my fury to rest upon you. Ezekiel 24:13. Cut it down. Why doth it cumber the ground? The second sign that such a professor is almost, if not quite, past grace is, when God has given him over, or lets him alone, and suffers him to do anything, and that without control, helps him not either in works of holiness, or in straits and difficulties. Ephraim is joined to his idols, let him alone, Hosea 4 verse 17. Woe be to them when I depart from them, I will laugh at their calamities, and will mock when their fear cometh, Proverbs 1, 24 and 29. Barren fig tree, you have heretofore been digged about and dunged. God's mattock has heretofore been at your roots. Gospel dung has heretofore been applied to you. You have heretofore been strove with, convinced, awakened, made to taste and see and cry. Oh, the blessedness! You have had before this been met with under the word. Your heart has melted. Your spirit has fallen. Your soul hath trembled. And you have felt something of the power of the gospel. But you have sinned. You have provoked the eyes of his glory. Your iniquity is found to be hateful. And now perhaps God has left you, given you up, and lets you alone. Heretofore thou wast tender. Your conscience startled at the temptation to wickedness, for you were taken off from the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Second Peter 2, 20 and 22 But that very vomit that once thou wert turned from, now you lap up with the dog and the proverb. Again, and that very mire that you once seemed to be washed from, and that very mire you are now tumbling afresh. But to particularize, there are three signs of a man's being given over of God. Number one, when he is let alone in sinning, when the reins of his lusts are loosed, and he given up to them. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness. Romans 1, 28 and 29. Seeth thou a man that heretofore had the knowledge of God, and that had some awe of majesty upon him? I say, seest thou such an one sporting himself in his own deceivings, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and walking after his own ungodly lusts? Romans 1, verses 30 and 31. His judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and his damnation does not slumber. Second Peter 2:13. Do you hear, barren professor? It is astonishing to see how those that once seemed sons of the morning and were making preparations for eternal life, now at last, for the rottenness of their hearts, by the just judgment of God, to be permitted, be in past feeling, to give themselves over unto lasciviousness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. Ephesians 4, 18 and 19. A great number of such were in the first gospel days, against whom Peter and Jude and John pronounced the heavy judgment of God. Peter and Jude couple them with the fallen angels, and John forbids that prayer be made for them, because that has happened unto them, that has happened to the fallen angels that fell, who, for forsaken their first state, and for leaving their own habitation, are reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. Jude 5, verse 6, 2 Peter 2, 3 to 8. Barren fig tree, dost thou hear? These are all beyond mercy. These are beyond all promises. 
These are beyond all hopes of repentance. These have no intercessor, nor any more share in a sacrifice for sin. For these there remains nothing but a fearful looking for of judgment. Therefore these are the true fugitives and vagabonds that be left of God, of Christ, of grace, and of the promise, and being beyond all hope, wander and struggle to and fro, even as a devil, their associate, until their time shall come to die, or until they descend in battle and perish. Wherefore they are let alone in hearing. If these at any time come under the word, there is for them no God, no savor of the means of grace, no stirrings of heart, no pity for themselves, no love to their own salvation. Let them look on this hand or that. There they see such effects of the word in others as produces signs of repentance and love to God and His Christ. These men only have their backs bowed down always. Romans 11, verse 10. These men only have the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Therefore, as they go to the place of the holy, so they come from the place of the holy, and soon are forgotten in the places where they so did. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 10. Only they reap this damage, they treasure up wrath against the day of wrath, and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Romans 2, 3-5 Look to it, barren professor. Number 3. If he be visited after the common way of mankind, either with sickness, distress, or any mind of calamity, still no God appears, no sanctifying hand of God, no special mercy is mixed with the affliction. But he falls sick and grows well, like the beast, or is under distress as Saul, who when he was engaged by the Philistines was forsaken and left of God. And the Philistines gathered themselves together, and came and pitched in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by the prophets. First Samuel 28, 4-6 The Lord answered him no more. He had done with him, cast him off, and rejected him, and left him to stand and fall with his sins by himself. But of this more in the conclusion, therefore I here forbear. Number four. These men may go where they will, do what they will, they may range from opinion to opinion, from notion to notion, from sect to sect, but are steadfast nowhere. They are left to their own uncertainties. They have not grace to establish their hearts. And though some of them have boasted themselves of this liberty, yet Jude calls them wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Jude 13. They are left, as I told you before, to be fugitives and vagabonds in the earth to wander everywhere, but to abide nowhere, until they shall descend to their own place with Cain and Judas, men of the same fate with themselves. Acts 1.25 A third sign that such a professor is quite past grace is, when his heart has grown so hard, so stony and impenetrable, that nothing will pierce it. Barren fig tree, do you consider... A hard and impenitent heart is a curse of God. A heart that cannot repent is instead of all plagues at once. And hence it is that God said of Pharaoh, when he spake of delivering him up in the greatness of his anger, I will at this time, he says, send all my plagues upon thine heart. Exodus 9.14 To some men that have grievously sinned under a profession of the gospel, God gives this token of his displeasure. They are denied the power of repentance. Their heart is bound. They cannot repent. It is impossible that they should ever repent, should they live a thousand years. It is impossible for those fallaways to be renewed again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Hebrews 6, 4-6 Now to have the heart so hardened, so judicially hardened, this is as a bar put by the Lord God against the salvation of the sinner. This was the burden of Spira's complaint. I cannot do it. Oh, how I cannot do it. This man sees what he has done, what should help him, and what will become of him. Yet he cannot repent. 
He pulled away his shoulder before. He stopped his ears before. He shut up his eyes before. And in that very posture God left him. And so he stands to this very day. I have had a fancy that Lot's wife, when she was turned into a pillar of salt, stood yet looking over her shoulder, or else with her face toward Sodom, as the judgment caught her, so it bound her, and left her a monument of God's anger to after generations. Genesis 19.26 We read of some that are seared with a hot iron, and that are past feeling, for so seared persons and seared parts are, their conscience is seared, 1 Timothy 4, verse 2. The conscience is a thing that must be touched with feeling, fear, and remorse, if ever any good be done with the sinner. How then can any good be done to those whose conscience is worse than that? That is, fast asleep in sin, Ephesians 4, 19. For that conscience that is fast asleep may yet be effectually awakened and saved, but that conscience that is seared, dried, as it were, into a cinder, can never have sense, feeling, or the least regret in this world. Barren fig tree, hearken. Judicial hardening is dreadful. There is a difference betwixt that hardness of heart that is incident to all men, and that which comes upon some as a signal or special judgment of God. And although all kinds of hardness of heart, in some sense, may be called a judgment, Yet to be hardened with this second kind is a judgment peculiar only to them that perish, hardness that is sent as a punishment for the abuse of light received for a reward of apostasy. This judicial hardness is discovered from that which is incident to all men in these particulars, number one. It is a hardness that comes after some great light received, because of some great sin committed against that light and the grace that gave it. Such hardness as Pharaoh had after the Lord had wrought wondrously before him. Such hardness as the Gentiles had, a hardness which darkened the heart, a hardness which made their minds reprobate. This hardness is also the same with that the Hebrews are cautioned to be aware of, a hardness that is caused by unbelief and a departing from the living God, a hardness completed through the deceitfulness of sin, Hebrew 3 verse 7 and so on such as that in the provocation of whom God swear that they should not enter into his rest. It was this kind of hardness also that both Cain and Ishmael and Esau were hardened with after they had committed their great transgressions. Number two, it is the greatest kind of hardness, and hence they are said to be harder than a rock or than an adamant that is, harder than flint, so hard that nothing can enter. Jeremiah 5, verse 3. Zechariah 7, verse 12. Number 3. It is a hardness given in much anger, and that to bind the soul up in an impossibility of repentance. Number 4. It is hardness, therefore, which is incurable, of which a man must die and be damned. Baron Professor, hearken to this. A fourth sign that such a professor is quite past grace is when he fortifies his hard heart against the tenor of God's word. Job 9, verse 4, and so on. This is called hardening themselves against God and turning of the Spirit against them. As thus, when after a profession of faith in the Lord Jesus and of the doctrine that is according to godliness, they shall embolden themselves in courses of sin by promising themselves that they shall have life and salvation notwithstanding. Baron Professor, hearken to this. This man is called a root that beareth gall and wormwood, or a poisoned herb, such an one as is abominated of God, yea, the abhorred of his soul. For this man says, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination or stubbornness of mine heart, to add drunkenness to thirst, an opinion flat against the whole word of God, yea, against the very nature of God himself. Deuteronomy 29, verses 18 and 19. Therefore, he adds, Then the anger of the Lord and his jealousy shall smoke against that man, and all the curses that are written in God's book shall lie upon him. And the Lord shall blot out his name from under heaven. Deuteronomy 19, verse 20. 
Yea, that man shall not fail to be effectually destroyed, saith the text. The Lord shall separate that man unto evil. Out of all the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant, Deuteronomy 19, verse 21, He shall separate him unto evil. He shall give him up. He shall leave him to his heart. He shall separate him to that or those that will assuredly be too hard for him. Now this judgment is much effected when God hath given a man up unto Satan, and has given Satan leave without fail to complete his destruction. I say when God has given Satan leave effectually to complete his destruction, for all that are delivered up unto Satan have not nor do not come to this end. But that is a man whom God shall separate to evil, and shall leave in the hands of Satan to complete without fail his destruction. Thus he served Ahab, a man that sold himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit, and stood before the Lord, and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. 1 Kings 21, verse 25, and 22, verses 20 to 22. Thou shalt persuade him and prevail. Do thy will. I leave him in thy hand. Go forth and do so. Therefore in these judgments the Lord does much concern himself for the management thereof, because of the provocation in which they have provoked him. This is a man whose ruin contrives and brings to pass by his own contrivance. I also will choose their delusions for them. I will bring their fears upon them. Isaiah 66, verse 4. I will choose their devices, or the wickednesses that their hearts are contriving of. I, even I, will cause them to be accepted of, and delightful to them. But who are they that must thus be feared. Why, those among professors that have chosen their own ways, those whose soul delights in their abominations, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. For this cause God shall send them strong delusions, that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God shall send them. It is a great word. Yea, God shall send them strong delusions, delusions that shall do, that shall make them believe a lie. Why so? That they all might be damned, every one of them, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Second Thessalonians 2, verse 10 to 12. There is nothing more provoking to the Lord than for a man to promise when God threatens, for a man to delight of conceit that he shall be safe, and yet to be more wicked than in former days. This man's soul abhors the truth of God. No marvel, therefore, if God's soul abhors him. He has invented a way contrary to God to bring about his own salvation. No marvel, therefore, if God invent a way to bring about this man's damnation. And seeing that these rebels are at this point, we shall have peace. God will see whose word will stand, his or theirs. A fifth sign of a man being past grace is, when he shall at this scoff and inwardly grin and fret against the Lord, secretly purposing to continue his course and put all to the venture, despising the messengers of the Lord. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, and so on. Hebrews 10, verse 28. Therefore against these despisers God has set himself, and foretold that they shall not believe, but perish. Behold ye despisers, and wonder, and perish, for I work a work in your days, a work which ye shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. Acts 13, verse 41. After that thou shalt cut it down. Thus far we have treated of the barren fig tree, or fruitless professor, with some signs to know him by, whereto is added also some signs of one who neither will nor can by any means be fruitful, but they must miserably perish. 
Now being come to the time of execution, I shall speak a word to that also. After that thou shalt cut it down. Proposition second. The death or cutting down of such men will be dreadful. Christ at last turns the barren fig tree over to the justice of God, shakes his hands of him, and gives him up to the fire for his unprofitableness. After that thou shalt cut it down. Two things are here to be considered. First, the executioner, thou, the great, the dreadful, the eternal God. These words, therefore, as I have already said, signify that Christ the Mediator, through whom alone salvation comes, and by whom alone execution has been deferred, now gives up the soul, forbears to speak one syllable more for him, or to do the least act of grace further, to try for his recovery, but delivers him up to that fearful dispensation, to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 10, verse 31. Second, the second to be considered is, the instrument by which this execution is done, and that is death, compared here to an axe. And for as much as the tree is not felled at one blow, therefore the strokes are here continued till all the blows be struck at it that are requisite for its felling. For now cutting time and cutting work is come. Cutting must be his portion till he be cut down. After that thou shalt cut it down. Death, I say, is the axe which God often uses therewith to take the barren fig tree out of the vineyard, out of a profession, and also out of the world at once. But this axe is now new ground. It comes well edged to the roots of this barren fig tree. It has been wetted by sin, by the law, and by a formal profession, and therefore must and will make deep gashes, not only in the natural life, but in the heart and conscience also of this professor. The wages of sin is death. The sting of death is sin. Romans 6, verse 23. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. Therefore death comes not to this man as he doth to saints, muzzled, or without his sting, but with open mouth, in all his strength. Yea, he sends his firstborn, which is guilt, to devour his strength, and to bring him to the king of terrors. Job 18, verses 13 and 14. But to give you in a few particulars the manner of this man's dying, number one, now he hath his fruitless fruits beleaguer him round his bed, together with all the bands and legions of his other wickedness. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. Proverbs 5, verse 22. Number two. Now some terrible discovery of God is made out unto him to the perplexing and terrifying of his guilty conscience. God shall cast upon him and not spare, and he shall be afraid of that which is high. Job 27, verse 22. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 5. Number three, the dark entry he is to go through will be a sore amazement to him, for fear shall be in the way. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 5. Yea, terrors will take hold on him, when he shall see the yawning jaws of death to gape upon him, and the doors of the shadow of death open to give him passage out of the world. Now who will meet me in this dark entry? How shall I pass through this dark entry into another world? Number four, for by reason of guilt and a shaking conscience, his life will hang in continual doubt before him, and he shall be afraid day and night, and shall have no assurance of his life. Deuteronomy 28, verses 66 and 67. Number five, now also want will come up against him. He will come up like an armed man. This is a terrible army to give to him that is graceless in heart and fruitless in life. This want will continually cry in thine ears. Here is a new birth wanting, a new heart and a new spirit wanting. Here is faith wanting. Here is love and repentance wanting. Here is a fear of God wanting and a good conversation wanting. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Daniel 5 verse 27. Number 6. Together with thee standeth by the companions of death, 
death and hell, death and evils, death and endless torment in the everlasting flames of devouring fire. When God cometh up unto the people, he will invade them with his troops. Habakkuk 3, verse 16. But how will this man die? Can his heart now endure, or can his hands be strong? Ezekiel 22, verse 14. Number 1. God and Christ in pity have left him. Sin against light, against mercy, and the long-suffering of God has come up against him. His hope and confidence now lie a-dying by him, and his conscience totters and shakes continually within him. Number 2. Death is at his work, cutting of him down, hewing both bark and heart, both body and soul asunder. The man groans, but death hears him not. He looks ghastly, carefully, dejectedly. He sighs, he sweats, he trembles, but death matters nothing. Number 3. Fearful cogitations haunt him, misgivings, direful apprehensions of God terrify him. Now he has time to think what the loss of heaven will be, and what the torments of hell will be. Now he looks no way, but he is frighted. Number 4. Now would he live, but may not. He would live, though it were, but the life of a bedrid man. But he must not. He that cuts him down sways him as a feller of wood sways a tottering tree. Now this way, then that. At last a root breaks, a heart string, an eye string, sweeps asunder. Number five. And now could the soul be annihilated or brought to nothing, how happy would it count itself? But it sees that may not be. Therefore it is put to a wonderful strait. Stay in the body it may not. Go out of the body it dares not. Life is going, the blood settles in the flesh, and the lungs being no more able to draw breath through the nostrils, at last out goes the weary trembling soul, which is immediately seized by devils, who lay lurking in every hole in the chamber for that very purpose. His friends take care of the body, wrap it up in sheet or coffin, but the soul is out of their thought and reach going down to the chambers of death. I had thought to have enlarged, but I forbear. God, who teaches man to profit, bless this brief and plain discourse to thy soul, who yet standest a professor in the land of the living, among the trees of his garden. Amen.